Today's subject matter is going to be crack injection sales installation, um, how to avoid some of the common issues that occur with that, and then how to create better repairs uh, that have a longer lasting uh, lifespan. Kind of first and foremost, a little bit of a history of Rhino, where it came from, and how we got to where we are today. Uh, our founder, Luke Seacrest, some of you guys on here probably know him or at least heard the name. Uh, he uh, created and built uh, a company called The Basement Guys in Central Ohio. Uh, I actually ran that company for him for about five years before switching over to Rhino full time. Uh, we got up to where we were in four states and about $15 million a year. And the reason we tell you guys this is because we feel it's important. Um, a lot of the products that we carry in the way that they're, they're kitted, uh, they're kind of designed to handle uh, a certain type of repair that needs to be done. So like the bowed wall kits, the corner repair kits, they're pretty self-explanatory, uh, but they're designed in a way to where you as the business owner or the project manager uh, can hand this to your crew members and have them go out and tackle a repair, knowing that there's not going to be wasted product. Uh, and that they're going to have everything that they need to be able to go out and successfully do that installation. Um, so that's kind of derived from our time spent in the industry, uh, kind of dealing with some of the things that were less than streamlined from other, other systems that were on the market. Uh, we really wanted to create something that was uh, very easy to manage and very easy to install. So Rhino was founded in 2000, uh, or, sorry, the Basement Guys was founded in 2000, 2001. Uh, the product line for carbon fiber was developed, um, and that's where Rhino was born. Uh, we currently hold patents in the U.S. and Canada for our bowed wall system. Uh, we have patent pendings worldwide for the concrete crack lock stitch, uh, which we'll, we'll cover today as well. Uh, we have obviously have multiple trademarks, things of that nature, and we're currently part of AGT Products. Uh, they are our parent company at this point. Uh, they have four sub-brands, Rhino being one of them. So to kind of go over here, we're going to start with um, kind of the typical foundation crack that you would see. Uh, this is going to be injections are only for poured concrete. So we'll kind of precursor that with this. Um, you're, you're not going to want to do a crack injection on a block wall, uh, things of that nature. It's got to be poured concrete. And it's not just limited to walls. We're going to go through some of the different uh, types of repairs that you can do with the injection system. So this kind of shows you the typical crack that you would see uh, in a foundation wall. You, you usually have the main, the main crack or trunk uh, that you have. Uh, that's where most of the leaking is going to occur. But what you don't necessarily see is going to be the little cracks that come off of it. Uh, those can be below the surface and they may not even be visible, um, but those can turn into uh, larger cracks in the future. This would be kind of a topographical view of that, uh, kind of looking down from above the wall down into it. Uh, this kind of shows you the damage that can occur. Uh, the surface is typically going to be a little bit wider, it's a little bit narrower. Uh, they don't always crack all the way through, so you're not always going to have a full depth repair. Uh, that's important because sometimes when you do the injections, um, you know, you could get little to none that's going to come through the following port if it's just a shallow, shallow injection. Uh, but then it could also be cracked all the way through to the outside where depending upon the material that you're using, uh, you may or may not get it to follow to the next port because it could just be going out to the gravel or the soil on the outside. This slide kind of explains why uh, the crack injections leak like they do. Uh, obviously, the outside, you either have dirt or soil. You're going to have your outside water pressure, uh, and that water is going to find the path of least resistance, which is going to be uh, the crack in question. Um, you know, the, the surface paste is basically installed directly over the crack itself. Uh, you have your injection ports that are placed directly over top of that crack, and that's going to give you access to fill that, that concrete full depth through pressure. So Rhino is unique. We have uh, two different versions of injection material. Uh, we have a polyurethane and we have a resin injection. Uh, the polyurethane, you can use it on wet or dry cracks. Obviously, that's not an actively leaking crack. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get the surface epoxy to bond to that. Uh, so, you know, there can be dampness, there can be moisture, uh, but obviously if you have like water squirting out through the wall, it's not going to be uh, the time to do that application. Uh, our, our Polyurethane is unique in the sense that it doesn't have to be activated with water. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, your tubes of polyurethane will be one part uh, chemical, and then the other side will be water, or the kit will come with, uh, it looks kind of like a turkey baster that you actually have to inject water in to get it to foam. Uh, 
Uh, ours is self ex self expanding, uh, so you have a faster set time. It's going to expand 14 times its volume, uh, and this is going to be used to fill large voids and block moisture that may be coming through that crack. The the polyurethane uh, doesn't really offer a whole lot of tensile strength. Uh, so it's not going to be for structural cracks. It's going to be mainly just for filling, uh, filling water issues. Now the injection resin is an extremely low viscosity. Uh, it, it is similar as the viscosity of water. Uh, so it's designed for hairline cracks. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to cure solid and have tensile strength that's equal to the concrete. Uh, so it would be used for your structural cracks. Uh, again, it'll block moisture. Uh, but if you have a crack that's all the way through the wall uh, and, you know, the material is thin enough that it would never build enough to actually inject the wall. It's just going to leach out in, into the outside of the wall. Uh, so if you were to get into a situation like that, we would recommend to use the combination of polyurethane to kind of use as a dam uh, to, to where you could actually fill that crack um, or to dig on the outside. Uh, to seal that off, but the, the point of a crack injection really is to not have to go and, and do excavation on the outside. It's designed to where you can control the water or fill that crack from the inside. That is the true benefit of it. Um, the crack injection material does set pretty quick um, in, in terms of epoxy. Uh, if you're doing a resin injection, you're not going to be able to remove the ports uh, on, on the same day. It's going to take about 24 hours is what we recommend for that material to be left alone uh, before the surface were to be ground afterwards or the ports would be to, to be removed. Uh, so if, if most of our installers, if they're doing a resin injection, uh, they'll just do the injection and then let the homeowners know that the ports can be removed if they prefer uh, at a later date. They could do it themselves. You know, all it takes is a, a little tap with a hammer and they'll, they'll break their bonds with the concrete. So kind of some checklists to go through before you do a crack injection on a poured wall. Uh, this is going to be depending upon what part of the country you would be in, uh, but occasionally you'll see what looks like brick, but it's just the forms of the concrete. Uh, it has kind of a faux brick pattern, has the, the, the fake mortar joints, and then it has kind of a texture of the brick. Uh, if you run into that, you need to uh, grind those with the wavy texture off of that. Uh, where, the, where the ports and the surface space are going to be installed uh, and that has to be done because if you don't your ports aren't going to really have a good bond they're basically going to be sitting on the high ridges rather than on the concrete itself so if you don't grind those areas flush you tend to have a situation where the port is unbalanced uh, you go to put your your nozzle into it and you'll break it free or you just don't have a really good seal on that area and when you do your injections it'll leak right there uh, all of the hairline cracks that are coming off of the main the main branch there needs to uh, be covered with uh, high strength paste. You don't necessarily have to inject them. A lot of the times they're so thin that you couldn't get material in them anyway, but nonetheless they need to be covered uh, in the event that that does connect over to the main crack because you'll you'll basically create a situation where again the resin or the poly will want to come out on that part of it if it's not covered. Uh, a couple of things for port uh, locations. Your first port is going to be installed about 12 inches from the slab. Uh, you don't have to go all the way to the floor with your port location. But the material will travel up and down until that's filled. Uh, and then for the final injection port, you want that to be about a foot below your soil level on the outside of the wall. Uh, obviously, the reason for that is you don't want to create a situation where you're injecting material uh, basically out to the outside environment. Uh, so you want to come about a foot down from your from your uh, soil level, stop there. Um, that'll get it close enough. If you do, for some reason, want to take it all the way up, all the way up to like the sill plate, uh, you would have to go to the outside. If it's cracked all the way through, you would have to go to the outside and you know parge that with hydraulic cement or the same high strength paste that you use on the interior. Uh, and then the crack must be drier. Prior to the port location, we kind of already touched on that. Uh, you know, th this only works as good as the bond that you have on the surface. You know, if this wall is, is damp, uh, you can do things like take one of the little mini propane torches to kind of heat that up, see if you can draw the moisture out of it. Um, obviously, if you're going to do that, do that with 
high level of caution. Uh, you know, if there's anything flammable around it, obviously get it away. Um, you know, you can usually take a wire brush and, and get that to be opened up a little bit. Uh, some guys will use fans. You could use dehumidifiers in advance uh, to get that area dried out enough to be able to get the surface paste on there. So just your general crack injection process, uh, you're going to grind the surface uh, where, where the injection is going to be installed. Uh, if you've done any of our other like carbon fiber repairs, you don't have to go to the extremes that you do with that as far as the prep work with grinding. Uh, but it is recommended that you at least take like a wire brush uh, to that crack itself. And that's going to remove any loose concrete. Uh, you know, it might expose some of those little mini fr fractures that are coming off of it so you know that they're there so you can uh, get this covered with your surface paste. Uh, but you're going to mark your, your port locations. They're going to be about every foot of the wall. Uh, obviously, you know, if you have some deviations in the crack, it's not completely straight like this picture. Uh, you'll you'll want to get some ports out onto those if they're large, larger cracks just so you can make sure that you get those sealed up really well. Uh, one thing that's important about the port base locations. Um, you can kind of see it in this picture how the epoxy is mounted up uh, to where you can't see the port base at all. Uh, that's important because it basically gives you uh, certainty that you're, you're not going to have it leak. So if you were to simply uh, just stick the port on the wall and call it good, uh, once you put pressure on that, you'll typically get some leaking around that port base. So by mounting the epoxy up around that port base, uh, it just guarantees you that you're going to have a really good seal on that area because uh, that's where most of the pressure is going to be generated. Uh, once the epoxy is hardened, you can begin the injection. Uh, we get the question a lot, how do I know if the epoxy is cured enough or not? Uh, so we call it the fingernail test. So if you can take your fingernail and uh, leave an indentation in the epoxy or a screwdriver, uh, if, it, if it indents the epoxy, you're, it's not cure enough yet. Uh, if you were to go ahead and inject when it's semi-cured, uh, you'll basically get big bubbles on the wall uh, or it'll just delaminate off the wall and your, your injection material won't travel from port to port. Uh, so if you can, so if you do take your thumbnail or your screwdriver and it doesn't dent it, at that point, it's ready to inject. Uh, it's always going to be di different um, depending upon the environment, you know, temperatures, moisture content, all of those things come into play. So there's not really like a number that we can give you. Uh, but typically it's going to be 30 minutes to an hour uh, is what you should expect uh, for, for how long it's going to take for that to cure out before you can do your injection. Once everything's cured out, you're going to start from the bottom port location. Uh, you're going to insert either your, your polyurethane or your resin. Uh, you, you just basically put the nozzle right into the port. You'll feel it click. Uh, our ports are actually tapered on the inside that's to be able to receive different sized nozzles. Uh, but also it gives you a, a, an audible and a physical click when you have that properly inserted. Uh, that's important. Now, if you don't have it all the way inserted, you could potentially have it, the material blow back out on you. Uh, but essentially you start from the bottom port location. You're going uh, you're gonna to inject that until you see the material coming out of the port located directly above it. Uh, at that time, you'll pull your uh, epoxy gun back, switch it up to the next port, go ahead and cap off the first port that you just injected and you just work your way up the wall kind of like a ladder. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned before, once everything's cured out, the polyurethane is about 15 minutes, uh, so it's a lot faster. The resin is going to take about 24 hours, uh, but once all that material has, has had time to dry, break the ports off or they can be left alone permanently. Next application is going to be uh, for slabs. So this would be for guys that do, um, you know, parking garages or homes or pool decks, anything of that nature. Uh, you know, obviously residential. You can do it two ways. Uh, so you can do it with pressure, kind of like you see in the bottom picture, where you would install your porch directly on the surface. Uh, essentially, the same process as uh, working on a, on a poured wall. Uh, but the other option would be to do what's called a gravity feed. Um, you, you basically just clean the crack up the same way, either grind it, tuck point grind it, uh, or take your wire brush, open that crack up a little bit, and then you can gravity feed that material, but essentially just dispense it on the surface and let gravity do its thing. Um, if it's a wider crack, you're probably going to have to broadcast either some sand in there 
or you're going to have to use a backer rod uh, and that acts as a retention so that uh, so that injection material doesn't just fall out into the gravel bed or the dirt below. And then obviously the true benefit of all of this is the ports can be removed, the surface can be ground uh, to get you back to a uniform slab. Uh, you know, if anybody does any poly leveling or peering, uh, things of that nature, if you have some 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 slabs that you're going to get back into into specs and and level again, uh, you could use this process <clears throat> to get the strength back in that crack itself. Uh, and then grind everything flush so you can do your carpet or tile over top of it uh, and not have any irregularities. Some alternative uses would be for driveways and sidewalks. Uh, and a lot of our peering companies will use them with, uh, you know, situations like this where, um, you know, the, the, the footers have cracked completely and they'll, they'll do an injection on this uh, to get that solid all the way back through the entire surface. Uh, rather than just peering off of it uh, and, and not doing anything to bond it together, uh, we'll do an injection and then typically either a carbon fiber wrap or some crack or crack locks or staples. But we'll get into that a little bit further. Uh, this is an application actually on a, a retaining wall. Uh, this was uh, a residential apartment complex. Uh, this was the pass through to the parking garage. I believe this was actually in Chicago. Uh, so you can kind of see the process here as far as your surface prep. They went really wide on their uh, surface pace, <clears throat> but you can kind of see the process of just working up the wall here. Uh, and then obviously you have some cracks that aren't quite straight, so it's, good, it's a pretty good example of what you're typically going to see. Uh, the next application is going to be crack injections for pools. I'm not sure if any of you guys do uh, pool work, but it's not just limited to the pools. It could be the slabs. It could be uh, you know pretty much anything associated with that. Uh, so obviously the first first important thing for the uh, crack injection process on a pool is that it must be drained and free of any moisture. Uh, there are marine grade epoxies available. Uh, we do have them at our disposal, uh, but obviously uh, you know that's kind of a case by case situation. Typically, if somebody has a crack of this magnitude, the pool is already going to be drained anyway. Uh, rather than trying to tackle that with scuba gear and all that other stuff, uh, it wouldn't really make sense to go about it that way. Uh, the first, you're going to grind the surface of the crack until it's free of paint, caulk, gunite, or any of the other pool coatings that could be tile. All of that needs to be removed so you can get to the actual concrete itself uh, to be able to do your injection. From there, it's pretty much going to be the same. Uh, your, your injection uh, port locations are still going to be 12 inch centers. You're going to seal the crack the same way that you would on a foundation wall or a slab. Uh, but then once the epoxy is hardened, you do your injection, same process. Um, the only thing that's really different here is you're obviously trying to keep the pool water in and groundwater out. Um, so you're typically going to have gravel and fill of that and things of that nature. So the polyurethane is kind of the go-to for swimming pool repair. Uh, it would be pretty tough to get resin uh, to fill that void just because of the way the pools are built. Uh, you're almost always going to have some form of gravel around that. So using the resin would basically just leach out into that and it would be extremely difficult to get uh, that material to take all the way up the, the pool shell. This is kind of an example of one of the uses that you could do uh, on the actual pool deck itself. You can see here this was the uh, the ladder for getting in and out of the pool and this this core drill that they did uh, and it was obviously the movement of people getting in and out uh, causes concrete to crack on both sides of it. Uh, so they used crack locks here to reinforce that and then did an injection right here on the edges. Uh, so it's kind of one of those things, uh, you know, any cracks that you see in the pool deck, you can get them sealed up so that way they don't have the opportunity to heave or crack any further than they already have. Here's a couple pictures of the actual process of uh, removing uh, the coating and getting to the true concrete structure. Uh, you can kind of see on the left there, those are the cracks that they had. They were obviously indicated because they were showing that moisture was being held in there. Uh, so all of the, the surface was ground off, the, the coating was removed. Uh, they actually did crack locks on this as well, because typically with the polyurethane, you're going to want to reinforce it because um, it's not strong. Uh, and then, uh, you know, they basically did their port locations uh, on top of this in between the, the crack lock locations. 
So kind of the advantages of uh, our product catalog is you have a lot of ways to make a crack lock stronger or to make a crack injection stronger and you do that through crack lock and our carbon fiber overlay systems. Uh, a lot of you guys on here are, are using a lot of our other products so you can use those same things with an injection uh, to improve the lifespan of that, that injection. Uh, the first one we're going to cover is going to be the crack lock. Uh, those are the, the little areas that you saw there. It had two, two holes drilled and then the, um, the single blade pass between it. Uh, what you're doing with this is you are subsurface reinforcing those cracks. So you're keeping that crack from being able to open, uh, to move the pressures that are being there. It's going to counter that. Uh, so if you do an injection, you don't have to worry about it breaking down the road or that crack continuing to grow. Uh, and then getting a service call from your customer saying, hey, that injection you did two years ago, it's leaking again. Uh, you go out there to find out that it's not the part that you actually injected, it's just that the crack has continued to grow. Uh, by reinforcing those cracks, you eliminate the possibility for that. Uh, but the advantages of the, the crack locks themselves, uh, it's a higher strength repair. Uh, you're removing way less epoxy than just about anything else on the market that's gonna be a reinforcing product. Uh, it's going to be less expensive than a lot of those products. Uh, you don't have to worry about corrosion. Uh, that's really important when dealing with concrete. Uh, we have a, the common way of doing things is to put rebar uh, in concrete, obviously in areas that are going to be wet, like foundation walls, pools, things of that nature. Uh, you're always going to have water or at least humidity. Uh, over time, those things can become susceptible to that uh, rust and spall and just cause more damage. Um, but specifically to the crack lock uh, with the injection procedure, you're going to be reducing your service calls. You're going to be increasing your revenue on the front side, uh, and you're just going to be giving your your customer a better all-around repair. These are the crack locks themselves. It kind of shows how they're installed. Uh, like I mentioned, you drill two holes, make a single pass between them with a saw or a tuck point grinder, and they're just epoxied in place. Uh, but the key here is each one of these are good for just just under 200,000 psi of tensile strength. So you're introducing a lot of a lot of strength across those cracks. They're always going to be stalled uh, perpendicular to the crack itself. So you know if, if the crack shifts, you can simply just change the direction of it. Uh, you just want to stay as parallel or as perpendicular as you can with that crack for the installation. This kind of shows you what it would look like on a foundation wall. Obviously, you would have your crack here, uh, you know, keeping it as centered with that as you can. Uh, sometimes, if it's a if it's a larger crack, we'll ask that these are kind of offset. Uh, and what that does is it reduces the opportunity for uh, to develop cracks between the the ends of the crack locks there. So, by doing that, you're basically kind of putting the pressures out here and out here to where you don't really have the opportunity for those to, to split and cause more damage. The install process is extremely simple. Uh, you're basically just going to trace out the crack lock uh, every 12 inches up the wall. If you're doing an injection as well, as well obviously make those opposite from your port location. Uh, so just make it a staggered 12 inch. Uh, but yeah, you basically just trace it out. Drill your two 5 8 inch holes and then single blade pass. A couple more examples. This was actually uh, a patio deck on a residential uh, apartment complex. Uh, they had fresh pour, it had cracked and obviously in several locations. Uh, this was actually in Sydney, Australia uh, with a partnership through our deck. Uh, they're a distributor bus for uh, Australia and they had got the call uh, to go out and see if they could tackle this. So. I think there was a total of like 20 separate units that all had very similar damage. I think this was one of the worst ones that they had, uh, but pretty much all of them had signs of damage. Uh, this was actually the crack lock being used in conjunction with the injection. Uh, they gravity fed this uh, with resin and then used uh, the crack lock. This was an on-ramp uh, for Interstate 70. Uh, this was a fresh pour uh, that had cracked within the first month of it being there. Um, so this just kind of displays the strength of the repair. Uh, you can imagine if this is a strong enough repair for the DOT to put it on an on-ramp that's gonna experience heavy traffic, uh, it's gonna be certainly adequate for you know, a, a residential slab or a commercial slab for that nature with forklifts and semis, things of that nature. Uh, 
but you know all the way down to a foundation wall uh, you're really really creating a, a very very high level repair uh, for a residential type scenario uh, this would be a good example of your residential scenario uh, so this was poured concrete slab on grade and then they glued hardwood floor directly on top of that uh, you can see here they had some control joints that weren't behaving correctly uh, and then obviously any time that these slabs were to move uh, this was in north carolina so they do get a little bit of seasonal change uh, so when that would happen they would basically get uh, the flooring would pop up uh, would basically become unglued uh, so rather than you know chasing this thing around and removing the hardwood flooring five or six times which is what they were doing previously uh, this was for a large home builder uh, they decided to just subcontract this work uh, to one of to one of the contractors that we work with uh, and he basically employs you know two guys full time running around doing nothing but crack lock installations for service work uh, on new builds this is the same company another home uh, but you can see it's the same type of scenario this was an actual control joint that didn't break like it was supposed to so you ended up with large size uh, cracks that developed in the concrete around it again crack injection was done it was just gravity fed they actually broadcast some sand down in here because of the width of it uh, and then the crack locks were there to reinforce it to keep it from reopening in the future this is the same pool that we looked at before uh, but you can see the versatility of the products uh, this is on the right and after picture uh, so you can see that they all basically just go away um, you know it's the beauty of it that they didn't have to redo the pool uh, they were able to, to spot treat those two areas that were damaged uh, and then just coat right back over top of it. Uh, this would be a great example of a pool deck. Uh, same thing would kind of translate to a uh, commercial slab for like a warehouse or something of that nature. Uh, it's really common that the crack locks and crack injections will be done prior to like an epoxy coating or in this case a decorative overlay with stamped concrete. Uh, again, this is just important because you can see how how much material is left undisturbed uh, and then how easy it is to go back over top of it with something else to make it disappear. Uh, so if they had just done their decorative overlay with doing no reinforcing, uh, you know, there's a pretty good chance that down the road, uh, you know, those cracks would have transcribed back up through uh, their finished work here. So, you know, just extending the life of the repair, reducing the opportunities for callbacks, things of that nature. These are all examples of that. Uh, this is actually a company out in California. They they install enough of them that they've created wood templates uh, to, to expedite the installation process of, of the crack locks even more. You can kind of see here they have a red X that designates where the actual crack is, so they just simply line it up with that. Uh, and then that gives them their center point and then they just drill their holes and cut uh, and that's that's how they've decided to streamline it uh, we do have a partnership with one of our distributors uh, they can make you a crack lock template out of a piece of aluminum uh, that way it's lightweight same concept though it gives you uh, a template for every single crack lock location that you can simply lay down drill your holes make your make your cut uh, and then that is your prep work for the crack lock uh, this is just a simple uh, concrete overlay over top of the repairs that they had done. So the next product that we're going to talk about that will reduce your service calls and make a crack injection stronger uh, would be our crack repair. Uh, I know some of you guys on here, I know personally that you do a lot of crack repairs. Um, so this can be this can be used on poured concrete as just a general crack repair, and it can be used on block as a general crack repair. Uh, but what we're talking about here today specifically is extending the life of a crack injection. Uh, so what the crack repair will do for that will be to basically give you surface mounted tensile strength. Uh, so it will keep that crack from reopening, uh, but it also does a good job of sealing off that area. It is waterproof. Uh, so it's gonna give you a secondary um, measure that's going to prevent water intrusion uh, and it's going to hold all of those little uh, micro cracks or fissures from growing into larger cracks. Um, your general install process is going to be just to grind the surface uh, and then you're going to apply a base coat of uh, our epoxy adhesive 
lay your fabric into it and then do a secondary coat on the outside. Uh, there are several different installation methods for this, depending upon what you're doing uh, for this specific application. Uh, so we'll cover that here in a little bit. Um, if you're doing this for water diversion or water control, uh, you're going to remove a small section of the floor in front of it. So step one would be uh, to do your crack injection, uh, let it cure, go ahead and remove the ports. You can grind that surface epoxy off if you want to. If not, you can leave it alone. It doesn't have to be done, uh, but you remove a small section of your concrete, clean everything out past the edge of the footer, uh, and then you're gonna introduce some fresh gravel on top of the footer. Uh, and then you basically just surface mount this down the entire length of the wall and then let it come out into the trench that you've opened up. A uh, couple important things here would be you have to have gravel on the top of the footer. Uh, if you don't, your carbon fiber is basically going to seal right to the footer itself. Uh, and what you're basically doing with this is creating a water diversion uh, that is structurally reinforced as well. Uh, so the concept is if the water hits the back of the material that's cured and waterproof, it has nowhere else to go but down. Uh, so you're basically creating an environment where that water is forced down below the slab and then released into the gravel bed or the interior drainage system. Uh, so it's very important that you leave that void between the footer and the material itself so the water can actually release. And one thing here that was actually presented to us by one of the, one of the installation companies that we work with they actually take their dimple board or their uh, their drainage board and they'll cut a small piece of it narrower than this the strap itself uh, and they'll put that behind the material between the wall and the carbon fiber uh, and the same concept is protecting the weep holes that you drill it's basically just guaranteeing you that you don't seal that off uh, and that that water is going to be able to release this is kind of just a, a generated drawing of what you would typically see uh, with doing the crack repair, you can kind of see the benefits here is, you know, it's a 12 inch wide material. So not only are you covering that crack without having to chase it around, uh, you're also covering a lot of the surface cracks that may be there as well. Uh, here's an example. This was actually on the same job that we saw the retaining wall in Chicago. Uh, they did some crack repairs as well. Uh, this was an injection that they did. So you can kind of see it's a little bit bumpy behind there. That's what it's going to look like if you don't uh, grind the surface flush again um, but you know again it's a double waterproofing measure but you're also reinforcing the crack as well these next couple slides are going to be what we call a good better best repair uh, and a lot of our contractors have developed that as kind of their general way of doing uh, crack injections um, so a good repair would be a crack injection on its own or the crack repair on its own, they're totally interchangeable. Um, the better repair would be uh, to do an injection with a crack lock or with a surface mounted carbon fiber. Uh, and the best repair would be all three of them. Uh, so a lot of contractors will increase their warranty. Uh, they'll increase, um, obviously, their initial revenue. Uh, you're getting customers to pay for a better repair up front, so that doesn't become your problem if it leaks in the in the future. Um, you know they've already paid for those things to keep it from leaking. So you're reducing your liability. Uh, you're giving a better repair to your customer from the very beginning. Um, you know obviously a lot of the times this is going to be price sensitive. So you know that's where increasing the warranty is kind of helps helps that initial cost to be justified uh, you know you, you can explain to him that i'm you know i'm reinforcing this crack uh, i'm giving you you know two ways to defend against uh, any water intrusion but i'm also going to increase your warranty as well from a five year to 25 year some of some contractors will even do a lifetime warranty if they do all three repairs initially um, this is an example of some pretty heavy damage uh, so you can see that this was repaired with uh, hydraulic cement or high strength uh, concrete and down here where this kind of circle part is that's where the water was actually coming in you can see it's pretty heavily stained right here so the injection was done for the final couple of feet um, something that's important here is 
if the crack doesn't run all the way below the concrete using just a crack repair on its own uh, just the carbon fiber crack repair is not the best option uh, because the water can't release so you're basically creating a situation where the water is just held in the wall uh, and if you live in certain climates that have freeze and thaw cycles you're, you're basically just damaging that wall behind the material as it continues to move around uh, so if the crack does not go below the slab uh, you need to do an injection first. It, you pretty much have to do an injection first. So that way the water is never introduced into the wall itself. It's kept on the outside of the wall. Uh, but this contractor did uh, some repair mortar work here, did the injection, and then followed it up with our bi-directional crack repair. So this would be an example of a better repair. Uh, the crack locks weren't used simply because it's such a small tight area. Uh, that he wouldn't have been able to get any crack locks here in the final couple feet anyway, which is where most of the damage was. So the he and the homeowner elected to do, um, you know, the surface mounted reinforcement to uh, reinforce that area and again, uh, additional measures of waterproofing. Uh, here's a couple examples of our carbon fiber staples and crack locks being utilized with a crack injection. Uh, so you can kind of see. You know, you've got various different port locations uh, that are going to be dictated by your crack locker staple locations. These actually are staples. You can see by the crisscross pattern uh, that is called for with, with the staples. And then this is just kind of a, a page here. Sorry about that. Go back. So these are the basic products, uh, what they look like as far as what you can do. Uh, in addition to crack injection to make some structural repairs as well. Uh, so you have the corner repair, obviously that would be used if you have a poured concrete wall uh, that's both leaking and um, needs to be tied back together. Rather than just doing the injection and hoping that it holds, uh, you can actually structurally reinforce that. Uh, same thing with the carbon fiber crack repair, you guys saw that, we discussed that at end. Uh, it's very important to know that if there is any deflection in that wall, uh, and it's poured concrete, you can use our bowed wall repairs to uh, basically stabilize that wall, and then you can do your injection to get that completely watertight and then reinforced through the wall as well. And then the crack lock, we talked about at great lengths here, but this is kind of what the kit looks like. You get 20 of them per kit, and then a tube of the paste, uh, which is adequate to install those 20. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, the tough wipes. I'm sure most of you guys have used them before. Uh, they're kind of specifically made to remove wet epoxy from you, your tools, uh, any work surfaces that they may get on. Uh, it just creates a better, um, you know, clean work environment after you're finished up. Uh, obviously, it protects you guys from having to wait for this epoxy to come off your skin or mechanically removing it from your skin. Uh, and then obviously, it extends the life of your, uh, your tools and equipment. Um, you know, we have power epoxy guns that are rather expensive, so I tend to not let guys make that investment unless they are tough wipe users, just because, um, you know, if you, if you break our, our manual gun, it's $30. If you break the power epoxy gun, it's $350. Uh, so obviously, you know, a $20 investment for a tub of tough wipes is uh, a pretty sound investment when it comes to protecting your crews and your tools. And the last subject here, guys, is you know, here at Rhino, we have a full-time marketing staff um, and they just don't market for Rhino. They're just like, you know, your district sales managers and our engineering staff, uh, they're here to help you guys with everything that you could possibly come up with from a marketing standpoint. Uh, so that could be, you know, animated presentations. We have those already pre-generated for you guys. A lot of the contractors will load those onto an iPad or a computer and they'll use them to show the customers, to help educate their customers at the time of the initial uh, inspection and sales appointment. Uh, we have sell sheets that you can leave with your customers uh, that you know they can basically use to further research. Uh, you know the products that you discuss with them. You know after you've left, some people are more comfortable with that. So we have those things available on our website. You can you can download them. You can print them off. Uh, our marketing team can actually support you in getting your company's information on there for you if you want to do that. Um, we always do case studies and we rely heavily on, on our installers to provide that material uh, to kind of showcase the cool, the cool applications that they're doing with our products. Um, we have 
uh, home show marketing materials that you guys are welcome to. So we have pull up banners. Uh, again, you can use the sell sheets uh, at those. But you know, th those are really, really nice to have. Um, you know, it kind of takes the takes the load off of you guys of having to develop those types of things for your show materials. You can just call us up. Uh, we can mail it, we can get them sent out to you uh, before you have any home shows coming up. Uh, we have a ton of installation videos uh, and product demo videos. Uh, so if you guys need to do continuing training with, with new crew members or you just want to do a refresher, uh, you know, any one of us can do a one-on-one -on -one webinar with them, uh, but the videos are also there to reference. Um, and then all of our kits have instruction manuals in them as well. Uh, you shouldn't ever get uh, a repair kit that does not have instructions in there. Those are always going to be there for a reference on site, but they're also on our website as well uh, to where for some reason you didn't get one in the kit or it was lost. Uh, you can hop on our website to get that information as well. Uh, all of our technical data and safety data is on our website as well. We've actually just redone the website. Uh, so it's on the front side of every type of repair. Uh, so if you hop on Rhino Carbon Fiber and click on residential repairs for say bowed walls, uh, you know, it's going to show you some really nice pictures of installations. It's going to show you the process of how it's installed. Uh, but there's also downloadable technical data sheets and the safety data sheets. Uh, and those would be important if you ever need to pull permits. Uh, if your local building inspector is just kind of nosy and wants to see exactly what you're doing, uh, or if you're working with an engineering firm and they need the technical data to do calculations, it's all right there for them. Um, you know, speaking of engineering firms, we do have several that we partner with uh, that can do a stamp drawing in pretty much any state in the U.S., uh, but we also have a full-time engineer on staff that does that collaboration with them. Um, it, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily engineer to engineer. It could just be a simple question as far as, you know, what, what material should I use for this repair? Um, you know, Johnny Rice and Josh are our other uh, district sales managers and nine times out of 10, we can, we can help you with a design uh, as far as a case by case situation. Uh, but, you know, sometimes they get a little bit more technical uh, and it does require the engineer. Uh, so we can always get that information passed over them. Uh, the last thing we'll discuss uh, is just our, our apparel and giveaway. Uh, we we have you know hats and shirts and mouth pads and uh, you know design pads that we give away to our contractors all the time. Uh, those are things that you guys can utilize in your business. And again, you don't have to do any of the legwork to develop those. Uh, you know, our marketing team is basically here to make it easier on our installers. Uh, we know that you guys are extremely busy. A lot of the times you're going to be the owner, the project manager, uh, and even part of the installation crew. So, you know, working on your website and designing content, things of that nature, you know, it's always on your mind, but it's not something that you can usually tackle uh, on your own. So we're here to support you guys with that. Uh, so, you know, it could be case studies for your website. It could be pictures for your website or just simply putting the Rhino logo on your website to show that you know people in your area that are researching you know carbon fiber or crack repair uh, in their area that way you know they, they can kind of see like oh hey yeah you know i checked out rhino's website and this guy's an installer so uh, just things to help you guys grow and increase your revenue 